Good morning, Ohio. It's James Ernest of The Growing Truth here with the photographer of the game, Stuart Roy Clark. Stuart, thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure. So, what sports did you play growing up? So, in the little country that I'm from, um, with its monumental influence, um, the UK, and in particular England, I, I lived in the same house for all my youth, and then I moved up to the English Lake District. The game that me and all the other kids, certainly the boys, all played um, was soccer, or football, as we called it. Mm -hmm. Girls didn't really play it. That's something that's happened in the last 10 years in my sort of daughter's era. So there's your answer, James. It was soccer. So who helped support your interest in uh, soccer or football? I think that's a fascinating one because every week um, before COVID, before lockdown, when I would go to matches, I'd have 100 people want to carry my bags, in inverted commas. And they always wonder how it is that I'm the lucky guy because let's face it, I am. You know, this is a great thing to be going to. Put aside hooliganism and... Whatever else you've heard, you know, it's the best thing we've got to offer in this country, I believe. And I've been lucky for 30 years to have tied myself to its mast. So it's a good question. How did I manage to get that ticket, if you like? Um, I decided 31 years ago that it was a great subject and that with my upbringing being surrounded by soccer and my people-watching skills, my photography skills, that maybe, just maybe, I could be the one to tell the story of the game in change, which I thought would be the 1990s. But here I am, I'm still doing it, I absolutely love it, and to answer your question um, further, it wasn't just me deciding I would do it, I had to find ways of funding it, um, so I got in touch, or was put in touch by my co-author actually, John Williams, he was the one who sort of talent spotted me, he said, uh, you need to take your photos, the ones I've seen in the first month of you doing this, take them to the football authorities in London and uh, see what they want. And certainly they did, they, they kind of hired me. So for 30 years I've been freelance, but I've also had this foot in authority authority, if you like, whereby I can get access to the matches. So there's the answer, James. So, uh, yeah, it sounds like a lot of hard work, but, um, oh. sounds, sounds like, yeah, sounds like a lot of hard work, but it sounds like it uh, definitely has uh, paid off. Well, yeah, it's a lot of hard work in the sense that um, it's, you know, it's an absolute passion. But, of course, it's a thing that lots of people would like to do. So there is a competitiveness about me. I've been to more matches, I think, than anybody. Literally anyone in the UK in 30 years. So a lot of early morning starts, a lot of um, winter matches. You know, we play the game all through the winter. That's part of its purpose here, is to keep us warm and uh, sort of um, sociable in the winter months when we could just be sitting at home. And... Um, yeah, I've put in a hell of a shift doing it, but boy, what a thing to be doing. So, once again, there's my answer to people who are wondering. What was your first camera? Yeah, now, that's another big thing, James, that people ask me about, as if perhaps the gift isn't my determination, skill, or of my eyes, is perhaps the camera that I'm using. But, actually... I think it is my seeing, you know, if you gave me any camera, including these days a mobile phone, I think I could come up with something at least as good as you, let's just say that. But um, I bought a camera when I was 16 to sort of develop my artistic interests. So, you know, I was a good drawer. I used to sit in the town drawing everything. Then I thought I needed a proper camera. And in those days, in the 1970s, it was a film camera. And then... Um, I didn't really have many cameras after that, but the big the big one that I bought is the one I still use. So for 31 years, I've used the one big same camera, which looks a bit like a wedding camera. You look down into it, everything is back to front. All the other photographers laugh at me, and then they put their arm around me and wish that actually they were doing what I, I do and that they didn't have to 
endless amounts of film, uh, sorry, pictures on a digital camera where, you know, 4,000 aren't going to be used and only three are sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah, I was going to say that is the funny part about uh, the new modern uh, photography. You're right, there are so many photos that go to waste where when you uh, are just doing the film, you really focus down and you seem to get the better shot yeah. when it's needed. Yeah. So it sounds like you've been kind of... I am. So it sounds like you've been... Sorry, James. I, 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 no worries. I spoke over you, which is what I said I wouldn't do, so I'll back off. Here we go, James. Your turn. No worries. It's all good. So... Uh, so it sounds like you've been covering soccer for a long time. It sounds like you've grown up playing soccer. One of the things I thought was neat, uh, I read that I read that you uh, originally had a soccer goal in your own backyard. Yeah, I did. Um, my my dad wasn't the sort of most jovial person, or I didn't think he was, but there was a side to him that was very sociable and very engaging and, and very um, encouraging, let's say. I always thought he was a bit grumpy, but I don't think he was, really, on, on reflection. <laughs> so he built this goal in the back garden, which nowadays isn't a big thing. Lots of, If you go past lots of gardens in you know the US and in, in the UK, you'll see these white plastic goals that you can buy. But in, in those days, in the 60s, 70s, it was kind of unheard of. So he literally built it out of wood. It was full-sized. And it compromised the rest of the garden, which got smashed to bits with footballs and kids running around. And, and all the kids from the neighbourhood came around to play in the goal. So I think from an early age, I felt, you know, this game isn't just a game. It feels like it's sort of my game. And so my answer, James, to, to, the, to the listeners is that, yeah, I feel like I inherited the game of soccer. It was mine to do something with and then... In its hour of need, I'm not sounding like a missionary, but I did feel like it was in big trouble at the end of um, the 80s with the Hillsborough disaster and a, and a couple of other disasters that preceded Bradford and Heisel. I decided this would be my subject, and, you, you know, um, without putting my elbows out too far, I really went for it. What are some of the themes that you cover through soccer? I don't know if these are truly UK themes, British football, British soccer themes. I like to think they are. And the approach to this book, The Game, um, John Williams, the professor, as I call him, an academic, and me, the photographer, the sort of uh, romantic, probably, in a way, we, we put our heads together and said, let's have a big conversation in, in book form. We've both done many, many books before. Mine have all been picture books. Yours have all been clever clogs academic books. Let's do something that sort of bridges the two styles, if you like. We'll have a hundred pages where we talk about what are the things that make the game great. And then we'll have 200 pages of my pictures, you know, a real sort of bevy, a, a glory of um, a showcase to my images. So those subjects really were loyalty. I can almost put that number one, loyalty to a game all seasons so we passed in, in England and Scotland we passed through four seasons really that the season takes 10 months so you get summer you know autumn winter spring if I've got it in the right order and um, that loyalty but then there's the loyalty that most clubs never win anything you know so they win a few games but very few clubs out of the 6,000 that we have here that are semi-professional professional win any silverware and this is the point that you have to continue, you know, you, you should perhaps feel like you want to still support them through the worst days. So I could go on and on. The other the other kind of aspects really are the sense of humour that I felt up to Brexit, which really did change things and now lockdown, I felt that was a very unifying thing in our country, that humour was always there, you know. Uh, humour was always there, James, amidst the um, the bad behaviour or the edgy behaviour, the sweary behaviour. You still find, uh, have found rather, in all that time, a lot of humour. And then um, lastly, you know, one or two other things that, that um, come to note really are, are kind of um, what I call pluralism. So, you know, the Football League in Britain 
is very much about all these clubs joining up. So whilst we yell and shout at the opposition as if we hate them, I think there's an actual respect and a love. And what's unique in Britain is the amount of people who travel to the away matches. It's a small country. It's quite possible to do that. So it's a kind of great coming together, basically. And in a way, you have to kind of, you have to appreciate the opposition. In a, in a word, I suppose that's it. So there's a few of the things there, James, that really are pointers to why I've done this and why we produced the book. That's a real love letter to the game, um, you know, this book that you have before you. And it seems you definitely emphasize the fact that it's not just the players on the pitch, that it's the the whole, uh, the fans and uh, the stadiums and all the things that go into making the great game. Absolutely, James. The, you know, I don't know enough about USA soccer yet. I will do. I'm coming on about three road trips in the next 18 months. So we'll, hopefully you and I will meet again and we can talk differences. At the moment, I can really just go on and on about why I think our game in Britain is, 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 is so special. Um, just remind me of the question again, James. Just how you incorporate you incorporate the stadiums, the fans, the pubs, the cities. You incorporate so much more than just the eleven on eleven. That the game is a much bigger, richer tapestry. Yeah, fantastic question. That is exactly the kernel, of it, the heart of what I'm about. That when I set out to do it, so we've got this word football, but you know. It, in American speak, it's soccer. So when I started to do the homes of football, it it was plural. And it was meant to be about all the clubs, big and small. And moreover, it wasn't what most journalists were doing, which was concentrating on the 90 minutes of football, the managers, and as you say, the 11 versus 11. What I set out to do was show the whole kind of tapestry, the fabric of the game, you know, in terms of getting there really early, probably leaving late, um, sometimes even the days leading up to a match, what fans are up to, because they kind of live their lives by, you know, it sounds a bit sad, but a lot of us live our lives by these football clubs, I would say. So I, I was out to present, above all, the grounds and the crowds as if they are the star players, as if they are the the ones, the things that you'll always find at that club, and the players, however much I love them, it's fleeting. You know, they come and go, and the matches themselves, it's ninety minutes of emotion, and then it's gone. But um, that's the home of the football. And of course, uh, soccer. I mean, football has a. Um bigger historical significance and it seems that you cover that in your book as well yes you know i'm not going to turn it into a competition about which game came first because first doesn't necessarily mean the best there are certainly games of soccer or football in england that go back to 1300 you know beat that if you like what we could say to people the chinese might say yeah well we played a game 2000 years ago so it goes on and on I think it's a very natural desire. You know, if you put something round on the floor, even in front of a horse, which has been proven recently, they start nudging it about with their noses or kicking it even. You know, I swear that's what happens. So it wasn't hard for a mass um, society, if you like, to start kicking something around the streets. It, it's said to be ahead of a vanquished tyrant or whatever, whatever. But... Certainly in the last 150 years, the game started taking on um, rules and uh, a, a commonality around the UK, even, you know, across the border of England and Scotland, whereby, you know, by about the 1860s, um, we, we had three games. We had the Rugby League, Rugby Union, which was splintering off from football because they wanted to use their hands and have more people playing, and soccer became the rarefied thing that it sort of still is today. It hasn't changed a huge amount, to be honest. I think that the big challenges were 30 years ago when I began this, when they were going to rip up the old style of grounds and build all these shiny new ones with seats, and it was it was above all a sort of standing affair before that for the fans. And then now, James, this is the big test. Um, COVID and lockdown, we actually haven't got any crowds at the moment. We've just about got the games back, some of them. So, 
you know, John and I, when we wrote this, we finished on something like March the 3rd, not knowing what was around the corner. We just did this great love affair to the game. And then, blow me, within two weeks, the whole game had been closed down, you know, which we, we could never have uh, envisaged. So the book was written at an absolute amazing time. And now I stand a few months later, waiting for it to return, thinking... Yeah, perhaps there's a follow-up book to be done in two two years' time that, that tells the difference in in um, in old and new, pre and post COVID lockdown. How has the book changed from its original publishing? Yeah, that's that's a good point. We we did this in 2018. We did another in the UK only, really, or Europe. Then we did another version in 2019 because we loved it so much we thought we were really onto something with all this conversation. And then, you know, the publisher from America, Relegation Books, asked us, he loved it so much, he said, wow, I'd love you to bring this book to the US. And he didn't insist on us changing much, but we want, you know, it doesn't look like we have, but actually there's about a couple of thousand different words that are being changed because obviously we do speak slightly different language just like ruling you know which is the name of your um uh, show is spelled differently from in england and you know that counts as something and then i i wanted to add some new pictures james and add some new league tables um develop the the, the history line that's in the book you know so it's it's very much the book of 2018, but I think it's bang up to date. As I say, March, you couldn't get really much more up to date than that. Nice. So it sounds like, I mean, a remarkable book. It sounds like any of our fans, our listeners that are interested in the uh, the beautiful game of soccer or football should definitely check this out. So, Stuart, before we let you go, where on social media, where on the web, where should they check you out at? Well, okay, so I think I've got some copies of the book here. Um, I know I have. I've got them. I'm looking at them. But the, but Relegation Books is the publisher in the U.S., not the biggest publisher, a fantastic publisher. You know, I've a joy to work with. So you can get it through Relegation Books. Perhaps you can get it through Amazon because they seem to have everything in the world. And then in terms of checking me out, um, I've got www, you know, World Wide Web, if you like, dot homesoffootball.co.uk, which is, it sounds old fashioned with a dot co.uk um, address. I think dot com will get you there too, actually. So that's, that's me from my website. And then lastly, perhaps, James, is that Twitter is my main social media grab. You know, that's the one I like most. So I'm Homes of Football, or one word. Uh, that's me. And, um, you know, I'm following you. Maybe you'll see occasionally some tweets from me where I mention you and your show. And I'm checking up on your sports because, you know, ice hockey might... I think ice hockey and baseball, James, had I grown up in the USA, I think they would be my games, you know, probably as much as the soccer. So I'm, I'm so glad we do have this thing to brag about, um, the game of soccer, the game of football in a country at the moment where we're really looking for something to believe in. Definitely. And for the fans that are into art, I really like your other website, um, StuartRoyClark.com, the the one where you uh, have your other photos. You have a wide variety of uh, topics, and uh, I mean, they were remarkable. Well, thanks, James. I think that's another thing, actually, that's of great interest is very quickly, you know, because I can't go on as if uh, you're the only, I'm the only person that your listeners would want to hear. But over the years, you know, I spent 30 years doing something, but I thought I don't want to become a sort of sad, uh, what we call like a train spotter figure, standing on the platform waiting for the, you know, the next train or football match. So I did, I have lived in a life in that time also, beyond the game, and I lived in the Lake District for most of it, which is a beautiful spot. So on that website you're talking about is some landscapes and music festivals. That's the other thing I do. In the summer, we have uh, literally a thousand festivals.
vegetables, you know, that um, a bit like Woodstock, but smaller. And um, it's the same thing for me. It's a gathering of people. There's great sort of passion, eccentricity. You know, there's, there's an event, the, the actual performances. So, yeah, I'm 90% Mr. Holmes of football, 10% the rest. But the, I think the other 10% is quality. Excellent. Yeah, I was going to say it looked remarkable. I enjoyed checking that uh, website out as well. Thank you, Stuart, for joining us today, and we'd love to have you back on again in the future when you do your next book.